Good evening, church. Um, why don't you stand with me as we begin and just dedicate this time to the Lord. Um, we'll pray together. Lord, I just thank you for this night, God. Thank you that we can gather. Um, and Lord, that we can glorify you, that we can declare that we're your children, God, that um, you've bought us with your with your blood, God, that it was only because of Jesus that, um, that we can be brought to you, Lord, and, and now we're set free. And so, Lord, we, we just worship you today. We give you this time. Um, thank you, Lord, for washing us and setting us free and um, just to give us this freedom to praise you, God, and in the openness, Lord, in, our, in this back lawn, God. We just want to worship you and um, praise you, God. So thank you for this time. And also, Lord, we just ask that you would uh, prepare our hearts for your word uh, that it really would um, be like bread to us, Lord, and that your Holy Spirit would do a great work tonight among us through your, through your word, God. So we dedicate this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? was lost but he brought me in oh his love for me oh his love for me i'm gonna sing this who the sun sets free who the sun sets free oh his free His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the sun sets free? Who the sun sets free? Oh, it's free. Father's house in my father's 
Lord, we just thank you that we're welcomed by you, God, that we're just, uh, we are the children of God, and just it's such a precious thing, Lord, to be called your sons and daughters.
it's overwhelming. Let's sing this one more time. I want to sit at your feet. I want to sit at your feet. Drink from the cup in your hand. Lay back against you and breathe. Fill your heart be This love is so deep It's more than I can stand I melt in your peace It's overwhelming Overwhelming Lord, I pray that we would just sit at your feet tonight. That you would um, just bring us to that point of surrender, God. Surrendering our thoughts to you, God. Surrendering this day, Lord. The hills and the valleys, Lord. And that you would just cause us to melt in your peace. Your perfect peace, Lord. God, I pray that you would just continue to have this time, Lord, that we set aside for you, that you would move powerfully, God, because you're alive and well and you're working in this place, God. We pray for um, our tithes and our offerings tonight, God, those giving tonight, God. Bless them, God, from their abundance, God, and even from their lack, Lord. May they trust you. May they give cheerfully. continue to receive the glory through this worship, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be um, playing a new song. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, so if anything, just listen to the words, and we're going to be um, singing it a few more times on different um, days when we gather, so you'll hear it more, but this is the first time that we're singing it um, with the congregation, so um, when I heard this song, it just really ministered to me because it's a song about just dedicating ourselves to the Lord, no matter um, what it looks like, no matter what our road looks like, and just saying that we're available to God. So the chorus says, I hear you call, I am available. I say, yes, Lord, I am available. So let's just make this our prayer. Narrow as the road may see. Spirit leads Broken as my life may be I will give you every piece I hear you call I hear you call
heart says, here I am, here I am. You can have it all. You can have it all. pray that we would be available to you, that we would say, here we are, we hear you call, we say yes to you, God. Have your way within our hearts, and may you just open our ears to hear your voice tonight, God. Receive all the honor and glory and the praise, Lord, and we give this time to you, in Jesus' name. Good evening. Good evening. How you guys doing, First Love? Good week. Exciting week. Any anything anything cool going on? Is President Trump still the president? 
<laughs> All right. Um, open your Bibles with me to James chapter 4. We're going to continue on in the epistle of James. Chapter 4, some good stuff in here. I'm going to read the text. We're only going to go over the first six verses of the chapter, and then um, I'm going to read the first six verses of the chapter, then I'm going to pray, and then we'll dive right in, okay? So it says, Where do fights, or where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and you cannot obtain. You fight and war and yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Ooh, some meaty stuff, isn't it? Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity just to meet here tonight, Lord God, and this uh, just a sweet fellowship, Lord. Uh, I love this church, and uh, just filling in for Pastor John. I just want to continue praying for him, just lifting him up, God, and just uh, praying you just continue just to heal and mend and, and strengthen his heart and his life, Lord. Uh, I was blessed to just talk with him today, FaceTime with him today. He looked good, um, looks very well rested, and just seems like he's having a, a, as a nice a time as you can be, Lord. Um, and you're meeting him, and that's a good thing. And so, Father, we just continue to pray for him, for Elijah, for Josiah, for Kelly Grace, and for Heather. And just pray, Father, that you would just... Um, Continue to pour out your spirit upon him, Lord. Pray for my friend Brian, uh, Pastor Brian, his uh, friend or nephew, I think it is. Uh, he just texted me right now to pray for him, God. Um, he, was, uh, he has pneumonia from COVID, and he was supposed to be taken off the ventilator today. And uh, God, you, just, you, you know what's going on. So we just pray for him and many others like him, that, Father, you would uh, just bring healing and a full recovery. So bless your word, minister to our hearts, God, and we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen, amen. amen. Um, just as we continue on through uh, James chapter 4, I'm going to be um, sharing out of the New Living, okay? So I, I read you guys the, the passage in the, in the New King James, but I love how the New Living breaks it down. But there was a guy by the name of Edwin Starr in 1970 who wrote a song. It was a hit single called War. Ugh. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Say it again now. <laughs> right? It, it was a catchy tune, right? But that song is very true. It was a, it was a protest song, uh, I believe over Vietnam and everything like that. Um, but... Wars and fights have gone on from the beginning of time. They continue to go on today. We sinful people like a good fight. Fight promoters make millions of dollars off of UFC fights and boxing matches and this and that. And so we, we, we enjoy a good fight. As we continue through the book of James, though, I would like for you to remember this theme. The theme of a faith that works, or active faith. Active faith. And tonight, James isn't going to hold back, as you've already read. 
in any way with his words. James is, he, he's my kind of guy. He, he's, he's a tell it like it is kind of dude, right? And chapter 4 is, is probably one of the most in your face passages in the Bible. And James just brings it. So tonight, the point that he's going to address is fights and wars among us as people, but more so, fights and wars among us as a church. That's sad. That's a sad thing that happens. It's a bummer when it happens in a church, when you see fights and wars, when you see... um, I've never seen two sheep fighting, right? Like just going at it. I don't see that. I see rams. That, that's pretty brutal. And they just don't stop. And they just keep budding really hard. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's not a fun thing when you as a believer are f- having a fight or a war with other believers. Perhaps other believers in the ministry. Perhaps other pastors, you can kind of expect a certain ungodliness. You can, not, not kind of, you can expect an ungodliness from an unbeliever. Am I right or am I right? But when you see ungodliness among believers and they're going at it, that's an ugly, ugly thing. You guys need to understand something, though. We all need to understand something, though. We, whether, we're all believers, but listen, we're still sinful creatures. We still have this sin nature within us. We still have a selfish nature within us that desires for us to be, you know, we have pride. We, we want to be right. We, we want to win, so to speak, in the arguments. And so these things as a church, we're not perfect, we're just forgiven. <laughs> and we're all works in progress, right? Philippians 1.6, he who begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So we're all works in progress, none of us have it all together. Raise your hand if you had it all together. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Because if you have it all together, then you should be up here teaching me because I don't have it all together right? We all need to be listening to you. But throughout the Bible, people fought. In Genesis 13, if you're taking notes, Lot's servant fought, Lot's servants fought with Abraham's servants. They were warring. In 2 Samuel 13 to 18, Absalom uh, created a war with his father David. So much so, he was he wasn't just fighting and having an argument, you know, with his dad. I mean, Absalom wanted his dad dead. He was out to kill him. He was out to end his life. Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 15, they fought and they battled. And just like Joseph said in Genesis 50, what the enemy meant for evil, God turned around and meant it for good. And you look at Paul and Barnabas, when they fought, they split. And they separated. And they both went their way, and ministry just doubled. (laughs) God was able to take that argument and use it for his glory, use it for his good. And so God does that too as well. Now that's not an excuse for us to argue, or it's not an excuse for us to fight, but God has the ability to redeem what the enemy is trying to cause for evil and turn it around for his good. Amen or no amen? We see it all the time. That's just what he does. And so you might find yourself in this place right now in your own personal life with another brother or sister in the Lord, maybe another family member in the Lord. There's there's a a, uh, contention there. There's something that needs to be worked out. There's something that needs to be talked about. There's issues that just cannot be ignored. So you you can't uh, sweep things under the rug anymore. You keep sweeping it under the rug, all of a sudden you're going to have this big ball under the rug. And now when you walk into the room with this person, now there's an elephant in the room. You're, there, no, you know there's tension. You can cut it with a knife. It's not fun. 
But the interesting thing is, God is always at work in our hearts. And if you let him work in your heart, if you are obedient to his spirit, you'll have victory. But fights happen. Now why? But James is going to dissect this and give us a clear, in-your-face answer to that question. So verse 1 in the New Living, it says, What is causing the quarrels and the fights among you? Don't they come from evil desires at war within you? Don't they come from evil desires at war within you? It's interesting to me that when people fight, most of the time, people refuse to look at themselves as the problem. Oh, it's always the other person, right? You're never wrong. You, 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 you acted perfectly. You didn't say anything. You didn't give a, you know, you don't great give, uh, you know, angry eyebrows or any, some kind of crazy look. You didn't throw a little gang sign at him or whatever. You didn't do nothing, right? You're perfectly innocent, right? Your heart wasn't wrong in any way. They couldn't, they couldn't see your heart, but your heart was thinking some or, or feeling some crazy stuff. Your mind was thinking, man, I'd like to slap the taste out of your mouth right now, talking to me like that. James, if you guys remember back in chapter 1, before, once again, your pastor infected me the first week that I taught, um, in James chapter 1, 22 through 24, James says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For, the, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. What is James saying? Hey, look at the mirror. Look at the mirror of God's words and, and look at the blemish that you have and deal with it. Don't let God's word expose you and show you the blemish that needs to be dealt with and say, yeah, yeah. I look good, and walk away. No, that's like the person that wakes up in the morning, you got eye cheese, your hair's this way and that way, right? You got funky breath, and you get up in the morning, those people need to trim their eyebrows, they got hairs going all crazy, right? You get up in the morning, you look at yourself in the mirror, you got a big old white head, and you're like, I look good, let's go. Shame on you if you leave the house looking like that. That is a sin. Stop it. Repent, right? Never do that. But you, you, you don't do that. You take care of yourself. Listen, you take care of the outward appearance every single day. People, we are very, very good at putting on fronts and looking good on the outside. When we got junk going on on the inside that needs to be dealt with. Amen or no amen? We need to deal with that. If we don't deal with that, then what good is this? I see, at some point in time, this is, this is the theme, remember, is faith that works or an active faith. At some point in time, you have to take the word of God and apply it to your life and live it. Because if you're just coming here, coming to church and doing your thing, you know, hearing a Bible study, being encouraged, and you, and, and you hear the word, which God is going to hold you accountable for, by the way. You hear the gospel, which God is going to hold you accountable for, by the way. And you leave and you do nothing. You're, not, you're no different than when James chapter 1 says. God convicts you, he nails you, he busts you on certain things, and then you look at yourself in the mirror, yeah, I look good, and you walk away. That's not good. So if you are the type of person that refuses to examine yourself, James makes it very clear right here that those fights and wars come from our evil desires at war within us. So where do these evil desires come from? Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, he says, The heart is more deceitful than all else. And is desperately sick. Who can understand it? 
I the, Lord, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the minds, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, the new King James says. So don't trust your heart. Don't follow your heart, no matter what the world tells you. Follow your heart. Do whatever feels good. <laughs> no, don't do that. It's desperately wicked, and so you have these evil desires that are born from this desperately wicked heart that we have. It's our sin nature. And the Bible is true when there, it does say that there is none good. No, not one. Not one. We've all fallen short before the glory of God. We all have issues that we need to deal with in our hearts and thank god that he doesn't give up on us amen thank god that he's constantly working and so when the holy spirit reveals this within you you need to be dealt with by him and he deals with us lovingly he deals with us graciously he also deals with us directly he doesn't play any games, right? He points it out to you. Pew, busted. Busted. This word or this phrase, evil desires, can be translated to lust. That same word lust is where we get our word hedonism, which means the pursuit of pleasure or of or the, ple the the pursuit of pleasure, sensual self-indulgence. Wow. We have this desire in our hearts to want to pursue those self-indulgent, sensual pleasures. And when those desires aren't met, James says that we begin to fight in war. What? How? Look at verse 2. He says, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Wow, that is pretty clear. You fight and you war. You kill and you scheme to get something that somebody else has. Somebody else might have better status somebody else might have a relationship somebody else might have better finances somebody else might have a family somebody else might have you name it you fill the blank but there's a number of things that begin to work into our lives and James says hey you want things that you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. This word scheme means to make plans, especially in a devious way or with intent to do something illegal or wrong. Illegal or wrong. One of the best things that Gavin Newsom did, and he probably only did this one thing, was he canceled all public fireworks shows on 4th of July, because wasn't 4th of July the bomb, literally? It was amazing, amazing. But everybody was having fun illegally. This scheme mentality means to do whatever it takes to get what you want heard the story of a lady by the name of Rosie Ruiz who won the 1980 Boston Marathon but was stripped of her title after she was discovered that she left the race you see she took a subway <laughs> to the end of the line to the end of the finish line and her time was immediately put into question when it was discovered that she was 20 minutes faster than her personal record. And to this day, she denies it. <laughs> I 
the great Houston Astros were busted cheating, right, to win a World Series. And now there's an asterisk next to that championship. For us believers, James says, hey, man, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God. This does not mean, listen, by the way, I'm not saying, that, or I don't think James is saying either, that anything you ask God for, you can have. Oh, name it and claim it, brother. Like the faith and prosperity teachers teach. Speak it into existence. No, no, no. But he does drill our prayer life. He does drill our prayer life. I wonder how much of God's blessings are we missing out on because we simply just don't pray. Oh, we might pray, but we don't pray enough. When I say we, I'm also including myself. I don't pray enough. Praying can be difficult, isn't it? Praying challenges your flesh. Praying requires you to be still before the Lord. It requires you to turn off all the distractions. It requires you to put your phone down. It requires you to go off into a, a quiet place. That's why Jesus says, hey, get up in the morning. Meet with me early in the morning. I notice I don't get text messages early in the morning. <laughs> Unless it's some super hyper spiritual dude that is praying for me. But listen, the, the distractions are very minimal. But we get distracted as the day goes on, and we don't pray. Oh, we can start praying, and something happens. Something comes in our mind. We get a phone call, this and that. We start going on throughout the day. The Lord's desire is that we would be a praying people. 1 Timothy 2.8 says, I desire... Therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without doubting. Without doubting. James 5.16, he says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then lastly, Jesus said in Luke 18.1, Jesus said men ought always to pray and not lose heart. And so we are to pray. And we are to pray more. So that we don't miss out on the blessings that God has in store for us. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He says, true prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction be between uh, the creator of heaven and earth. That's awesome. When you pray, you are making a spiritual transaction with the creator of the universe, God. Charles Spurgeon also said, to the Christian, prayer is like breathing. If you don't have a prayer life, your spiritual life is going to die. Prayer is that essential for you to be in connection with the Lord. And so when you're not praying, you're missing out. And James nails it. He says, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You're missing out on what God is offering you because you don't pray enough. Didn't Jesus just tell the disciples, hey, hang out right here for an hour? Or just hang out right here for for some time and pray. I'm, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to pray. And he came back an hour later, snoozing away. Little tip. If you're having a hard time sleeping, read your Bible and pray. <laughs> Guarantee you'll go right to sleep. Best way to go to sleep, by the way. I don't see anything wrong with that. Okay? But if you're having a hard time sleeping, read your Bible and pray. If you're having a hard time staying awake, don't get all in the blankets and cover it up and start praying. And then, you know, take turns with your wife. And my wife, she prays in this sweet little voice. And as soon as she starts praying, I'm gone. 
She, she puts me to sleep. She lulls me to sleep. I try. I'm just being honest. But her sweet little voice just puts me to sleep. And then, uh, you know, she, amen? 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 Amen, babe. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that was good. Thank you, Lord. All right, I love you. Good night. <laughs> Guys, you know what I'm talking about, right? I'm not the only one, right? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Prayer is one of those things that we all know is vital, yet at the same time, we lack it because it's so difficult. Why is it difficult? Listen, prayer is difficult because the enemy knows the power of it, so he opposes you at every direction. So be mindful of the enemy at work in your life when you're trying to pray. And start cutting him off. Start cutting him off. James says, rather than praying and seek the Lord, you murder and you covet to get what you want. Wow, that's extreme. Murder is not necessarily the meaning, uh, necessarily the physical act of murder, perhaps. Although it can be in some cases. But most commentators believe that he's speaking of murder in your hearts in the context of having hate and discontentment. It's a spiritual thing going on. This type of attitude obviously is ungodly. It's very worldly. And we can also have this worldly attitude that if we ask God and he doesn't give, it to, give us what we ask for, then it, it can be very difficult to accept his answer. So then we scheme and do our own thing to try and get we manipulate to try and get our answer. I've noticed, I don't know about you guys, I notice that God answers prayer in three ways. Yes, no, and the dreaded wait. I, to me, it's dreaded because I think I'm ADD. So like, I, you know, popcorn doesn't pop fast enough for me. So like, I, I, I have to, like, come on, God, I need to an answer now. And sometimes God answers, boom. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he wants me to be still and know that he is God. He's in control. And so as we're praying people, our hearts begins to change. But if we don't pray, we get in the flesh and we start scheming and manipulating. And there are six natural byproducts that James mentions right here in verse 2. He says, one, you scheme. Two, you you kill to get it. Three, you get jealous of what others have. Four, so you fight. Five, you wage war. Six, you seek to take it away from them. Wow. Verse three says, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Interesting. Now he addresses the motives of our heart. So first he's addressing the desire. First he addresses where these evil desires come from, us, our hearts. Then he addresses our lack of prayer. And now he addresses that when we do pray, our motives are all messed up. Our motives are selfish. The world says, hey, do whatever, you, whatever feels good, man. It's all, the world is your oyster. You're the captain of your own ship. You're the master of your own destiny. Do whatever you feel is right. Oh, it's, it, 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 what is it? It's, it feels so right, it can't be wrong. All these things. So what ends up happening in our prayers is that our prayers are now directed to what will bring us pleasure rather than what brings God pleasure by putting ourselves in the middle of God's will. And listen, when you place yourself through prayer and through submission to his word and obedience to his word, you place yourself right in the middle of God's will and you will never be disappointed, ever. Ever. My pastor used to say, put yourself under the spout where the glory comes out. And that's so true. 
And when you, when you are just completely just diving into the flesh and giving into the flesh and fighting and warring and scheming and going at it and there's discontentment and all this stuff, man, you end up with this. Oh, the flesh is capable of so many ugly things. And James is nailing it right now. We don't want to have this attitude where it's not your will, God, but it's my will that gets done on earth. We don't want to be like, you know, well, we need to understand that prayer is not getting your will done in heaven. It's about getting God's will done on earth. And so we have to allow the Lord to work on the attitudes of our hearts when we're off. And we can be off. And listen, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with praying for that good job. There's nothing wrong with praying for that relationship. There's nothing wrong with praying for that better vehicle that you need. There's nothing wrong for praying for a better life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you would have it more abundantly. We're speaking of a, of a he's speaking of a, a spiritual abundant life. But I believe as I look at the scriptures that those in place themselves in the will of God and, and, and were, were obedient to the Lord, they were the most blessed people on the earth. Job, it says that Job was a fearless man, one who feared, was a, was a blameless man, one who feared God and shunned evil. And he had all this cattle to prove how blessed he was as a man. Abraham was a very blessed man. Solomon, because he asked wisdom from God, God blessed him incredibly. David, because he was a man after God's own heart, blessed him incredibly. There's nothing wrong with being blessed. It's a, the, the, the problem is, is when all those, well, there's, nothing problem, there's, no, there's no problem with being wealthy. The problem is when that wealth has a hold of you. When, when, when that's all you pursue. When that's all you care about. There's more to life than just creature comforts. Be spiritually healthy and just let God bless you along the way. Amen? That's just, that's just, that's just what he does takes care of you. He's never not faithful. (laughs) He's never unfaithful. I am. He's never unfaithful. But look at verse 4. Ooh, he drops it right here. He says, You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with this world makes you an enemy of God? I say again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. In the King, New King James, it says, you adulterers and adulteresses. Many early commentators believed that, one, it was just only adulterers. And that some other guy, I can't remember his name, threw in adulteresses. No, it was just adulteresses and then he threw in adulterers. And he was referring, referring to it as being a, a sexual immorality. That's not what James is talking about. He's talking about spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery where you are idolizing something greater than, you have made that something, whatever it is, that pursuit of something or that whatever, the thing that you are scheming for, the thing that you're killing, the thing that you're fighting and worrying about, you have made that so much more important to you than what God's will is for your life. And now you're committing spiritual adultery against the Lord. And James is addressing that. He says, you spiritual adulterer, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? How many things in this world have the glitz and the glam and the this and the that that draw us away from the Lord and we fall prey to it every time? Think about your life. Think about the things that happen in your life. Think about the things that work on you on a daily basis. Think about those things. 
those weights and, so, and those sins that so easily ensnare you. You know what it is. It's like that fisherman trying to catch trout. He uses power bait. It's colorful, it sparkles, has a little scent. It's a little piece of blobby clay. You put it on the hook, throw it in there. The fish bite it every single time. Or they use a lure. It's a different kind of lure to catch a different kind of fish. And it works every single time. If it works, why would he change it? Whatever works on you. If it's these six things that, that, that James is talking about, scheming, killing, jealousy, fighting, warring, add in lust, because he mentions adultery, add in covetousness, add in whatever you, whatever you want to throw in there. If that works on you, why would Satan change up the bait? It works on you. You have to get smart. I have to get smart and say, ah, no, 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 not today, Satan. That ain't going to work on me. I already know you. I already know your schemes. I already know how you have affected my life. And today I say no more. But we don't say no more. <laughs> we make ourselves a friend of this world. And James warns us. That if you make yourself a friend of this world, you become an enemy of God. If you are more attracted to the world and the things of this world, if those things draw your attention more than your love for Jesus and your love for the Lord, and you pursue the world and the things of this world more than you pursue God, be very careful that you don't become an enemy of God. Because when I read the Bible... From Genesis to Revelation, every enemy of God loses. You don't win. Not even Satan wins. And Satan is a billion times more powerful than you. And God's just going to speak a word and he's done. You know, the Bible says, I believe it's in Isaiah. Revelation. There's a scripture that says that we're going to see Satan. And we're going to look at him and we're going to go, is that the one? Him? Urkel? Him? He's the one that created all the havoc in my life and in this world? Him? Yes. <laughs> yeah, with a word. Boom. So what brings you more pleasure, the things of this world or the things of God? First John 2, 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This, my friend, makes you an enemy of God. And like I said, I don't ever want to be an enemy of God. Jesus said in Mark 8, 36, he says this. What would it profit a man if he gains a whole world and loses his soul? Go ahead. Go ahead. Do whatever feels right. Chase the world. Go after it. Go do whatever... Blah, 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 all those things I mentioned. Go, go, go. Jesus says, what would it profit you if you gained the whole world and you lose your soul and you go to hell for all of eternity? Is whatever that pursuit is, is whatever that sin is, is whatever that thing is that pulls you away from God, listen, is that worth going to hell for? Is making yourself a friend of this world and the things of this world worth losing your soul? My wife, years ago, she was a, a youth leader over at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs with Raul Reese. And um, 
years ago, as her career was just starting out, Jessica Alba was there in the youth group, and she was just starting to do the uh, TV show Flipper. And my wife had the opportunity as one of the youth leaders to be able to disciple Jessica Alba. And um, Jessica Alba today is like a billionaire. She's got a clothing line and makeup and all this other stuff. And I don't even know when was the last time she did a movie. But it wasn't that good. So it didn't matter. But here's the thing. God gave my wife a word. And, 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 and she was... Uh, just starting out, as I said, and, and, and she had just gave her life to the Lord. And so as my wife was discipling her, she said, God, God gave me this word to share with you, Jessica, that because of your beauty and because of your talent, you're going to be raised up quick, but you're going to have to make a decision to either follow after the world and your career or follow the Lord. Because if you follow your career, it's going to pull you away from the Lord. We see what she chose. Now, we don't have contact with her or anything like that, so I don't know where she is spiritually. I'm not going to judge where she's at with the Lord. But my wife has like a next tell with God. God speaks to her and, yep, say that. I'm like, okay. She's very clear. She's on point. People always sell themselves cheap to sin. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which was the equivalent of 20 bucks today. He betrayed Jesus. People destroy their marriages and their families and their walks with the Lord for a fling or a one-night stand or a momentary fleshly uh, pleasure with some guy or some girl. They just throw all that away. People go to prison because of an outburst of wrath that causes them to do something very destructive and they get locked up. People drive drunk and kill somebody because they just couldn't control themselves. There's no such thing, by the way, of a Christian that can be in total control of the flesh. When the flesh takes over, it's, it takes over. We, when you, if, if you have an anger problem, I've heard many people say, oh, I don't know what happened, I just blacked out. Well, black out and go that way. Don't come towards me. But have you heard that before? Maybe that's you. I just blacked out. I mean, your flesh just went in a rage. Nobody has control of their flesh when it's out of control. And so James says, hey, if you want to be a friend of this world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And that's a very dangerous, dangerous place to be. And then he says in verse 5, he says, do you think that the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate and that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. In other words, God yearns for us to be faithful to him because he is faithful. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses, 1 uh, verses 16 says, Be holy as I am holy. In Isaiah, God rebukes the nation of Israel for being ungodly through their idolatry and their, their uh, 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 idol worship, all this stuff. They basically became friends of this world, which made, which made them an enemy of God. And I'm going to read this section out of Isaiah chapter 1 from uh, verses 10 to 17. I'm going to read in the New Living, and I want you to hear God's heart towards carnality. I want you to hear God's heart towards compromise. I want you to hear God's heart towards idolatry. I want you to hear God's heart about all those things that cause people to fight and war and go at it. I want you to hear his heart. He says in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 to 17, he says, Listen to the Lord, you leaders of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, people of Gomorrah. What makes you think? I want all of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I am sick of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened cattle. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. 
When you come to worship me, who asks you to parade through my courts with all your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgusts me. As for your celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath and your special days for fasting, they are sinful and false. I want no more of your pious meetings. I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual festivals. They are a burden to me. I cannot stand them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. And though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with blood of innocent victims. Wash your hands and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause of the orphans. And fight for the rights of widows. Woo! Andale! That is a heavenly spanking, man. But he doesn't stay that way. <laughs> because right after verse 17 is verse what? 18. And what does verse 18 say? Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. It's as if God snaps and then he snaps back. Like I, I really just want to, oh, I can't stand sin. I hate what it's doing to my people. And there's no doubt in my mind that God hates what sin does to you. And I know that you hate what sin does to you. So then, therefore, therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and help in a time of need. Amen or amen? Amen. amen. Let us come boldly. Let us run and seek the Lord. God yearns jealously or passionately for you and for your attention. And what a wonderful God we serve that God wants our attention. He, he wants to hear from us. He wants us to spend time with him. He wants us to get to know him. He wants us to learn his will for our life. He wants us to hear direction for our life. He wants us to hear how he wants to use us. He wants to just pour out blessing. And he wants to be just like, he, he, he's got so much. He's got so much to just dump it on you and pour it out on you. And then lastly, and he gives us grace generously as the scriptures say. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So James too. James is also like he's, he's laying it out and he's just being direct and he's just bringing the hammer down. But then he says, hey, but God is gracious. And just like the scripture says, he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. A broken and a contrite heart, he will not despise. He will not turn away. So it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what war you've started, what fight you're having. It doesn't matter what des evil desires are going on in your heart, blah, 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 all these things that we've talked about. If you simply just come to the Lord, he will humbly, I mean, he will graciously pour out love and forgiveness and mercy upon your life. But you've got to come. You got to recognize that. You can't just hear a scripture or a passage like this, a teaching like this, and just say, and be convicted and be like, all right, I'm good, God. No, you need to come. And you need to deal with this. And I love the fact that God is so generous with his grace. He gives us as much as you need. But you have to be humble in order to receive it. You need to see your need for it and be broken for the Lord. On the other hand, God opposes the proud. And when God is opposed to you, there is nothing you can do to move him. 
he is opposed to you. But just as God can't move him when he opposes something, or just as God can't be moved when he opposes something, you cannot move him when he is for you. And Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can be against us? Having God for you is the key of life. It's not being so much concerned that God is on your side. It's being more concerned that he's... I mean, it's not being so much concerned that you're on God's side. It's being more concerned that he's on yours. You want to make sure that God is on your side. So James says, quit your fighting. Quit your warring. Be content with where God has you. Avoid creating fights and wars. And if you do, you'll be blessed. God desires to pour everything out upon you. And tonight I believe as we take communion, before we take communion, God wants to pour out forgiveness and grace and mercy on your life. So if you're in a place tonight where this message has hit home, then you need to respond. I encourage you to respond. Don't look at yourself in the mirror and ignore it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, for this word. I thank you for James and this passage. And I just pray, Jesus, that you would uh, really just cause the people to respond. Those that need to respond, it would respond. It doesn't matter how long they've been a Christian. It doesn't matter if they're not a Christian now. God, you're giving people an opportunity right now to respond. We're all capable, Lord, of of fights and wars and covetousness and selfishness and all these things within us. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. God, you know everything that's going on within us. And God, you desire to set us free. You desire to cleanse us. And so, Father, move tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed before we take communion because communion is for the family of God. And if you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord, if you're here tonight and you need to repent, you need to get right with the Lord, I want to give you this opportunity to get your heart right with God before we take communion as a family of God. So I'm not, I, I have this light in my face. It's kind of hard for me to see out there, but it doesn't matter. I don't need to see. God knows. God knows your heart. God knows what's, what's going on in your life. If that is you, all you have to do is respond by faith all you have to do is respond by faith and I'm just going to lead you in a word of prayer prayer of repentance that's all it is, it's a prayer of repentance of you just surrendering this issue or issues or whatever is going, in, going on maybe husband and wife you guys have been battling and warring because you're, you, you refuse to admit that you're wrong in some way you've been going at it with your kids you want them to be a certain way, but God didn't create them that way. And you've got to grow with them just as he's growing with you. And you've got you to learn to, God's got to take you through all that. So if that's you and you need to respond, pray this prayer. Say, dear God, I'm evil. I need forgiveness. I need your forgiveness, God. I don't want to be your enemy. I don't want you to oppose me. I need you. So Jesus, please forgive me of all of my sin. Please cleanse me of all of un all my unrighteousness. And God, I give you my life tonight. And I surrender God, give me the courage and the strength to go to that person and ask him for forgiveness. Not to say I'm sorry, but ask him for forgiveness. And own up to where I am wrong. I mean, to own up to all of my faults. God, I'm, I'm faulty. But I thank you. I thank you, God, that you oppose the proud, 
but you give grace to the humble. And so I'm humbling myself before you, and I'm asking you, Jesus, to pour out your grace upon my life because I need it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's take the wafer. The wafer obviously represents Jesus' body, which was broken for you and for me as Jesus was there. 1 Corinthians 11, there at the Last Supper, he's meeting with his disciples and he takes the bread and he breaks it and he says, here, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So this is a reminder of his love for you. It's a reminder of all of the junk that you just confessed to the Lord. It's a reminder that he took the punishment for you. God doesn't punish his kids. He disciplines them, but he doesn't punish them. He put all of our punishment on Jesus on the cross. So we can thank him. So let's thank him. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for all that you have done for us, for taking our place and taking the punishment of our sin and our shame. And thank you, God, that by your stripes we are healed. We are healed. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take the bread. At the same time, he took the cup and he said, take, this is the blood of my new covenant, which cleanses you of all sin. Take this and drink this, and as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. I don't believe, by the way, we're going to be doing this too often. I believe he's coming. You're washed. You're cleansed. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Your sins have been forgotten They've been thrown in the depths of the sea. They've been cast behind his back as far as the east from the west. Job says he's taking your sins and he sews them up in a bag so he can't see them. God is amazing because of his blood. Let's take this. Father, thank you for the blood that your son shed on the cross for us. Jesus, we love you for that precious sacrifice. We thank you that, Lord, as, your sh- as you shed your blood, the church was born. We were given access to the Father, and we were given access to you, and we became children of God. And so we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your love towards us, Lord. We thank you that on the cross you were thinking of us, and we thank you that you grabbed hold of our sin, and you died completely. For our sin, you shed your blood to wash us and to cleanse us. And today, we receive that cleansing. We receive that washing. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead, take the cup. Oh, yeah. Next week, we continue on. Looking forward to being with you guys. And it got really dark. I don't see anybody. I love you. God bless.
drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. you guys fellowship with people even if it's at a distance <laughs>